again, welcome to part three of um, <clears throat> my story as a national serviceman in the Rhodesian Army. Um, uh, in, in this episode, I'm going to uh, recount one or two stories of what happened to me before I left for Independent Company. Um, in part two, <clears throat> excuse me, I ended off with uh, uh, becoming ill due to tick bite fever. Um, it was quite debilitating. Uh, your glands swell up. You walk around with your legs open to stop your uh, glands and your legs rubbing on on your nether regions, and um, got a lot of headaches. I was put on light duties and uh, back at the base camp at Four Indep, and because I established a relationship with a, a, a young lady in the casino by this time. It was a wonderful opportunity for me to go around and, and see the crocodile farm and, and have a swim at the Azambezi Hotel, which was a lovely hotel with a big thatch roof. And then, of course, there was the Elephant Hills. Um, we went up there and pulled the one-armed bandits, and, and um, we had a lovely time. I spent a lot of time at her home. Uh, for the week or so that I was recovering, week to 10 days. Um, then, of course, there was the casino hotel where she was a croupier. I used to go and sit with her until late at night, and um, it was a wonderful time. And on, on the weekends, everyone would gather around the tennis court at the back of the hotel and play tennis. <clears throat> and then, of course, there was the magnificent... Victoria Falls Hotel, the old colonial hotel that had a, a beautiful view over the uh, the bridge that goes into Zambia, which will feature in future stories because there was a big punch up at that bridge. Um, and it was a nice place to sit and have a barbecue, a braai as we called it in, in Rhodesia. They had a lovely big table of meats, excellent meats and salads at the Vic Falls Hotel outside. They had a uh, a reasonably good band, and we would dance, and I would dance very slowly and tenderly because of the the bug I was suffering from. But it was a great time. Anyway, time went by, and uh, very shortly I was posted back out to Jambezi. And while I was away, a couple of things happened. Well, the first one was that the uh, Peters Motel um, was attacked by a group of um, six to ten terrorists who st stood on the um, eastern side of the road going to Bulawayo and fired across the road into Peters. Um, I think I'm correct in saying that a travelling salesman or somebody who was standing at the re at the reception got killed in this attack. Um, I know obviously other guys did the follow up. I wasn't there. I was out at Jambezi, but I. I heard about it through through our radio net. Uh, we got a bit of an update of what was going on everywhere. And, um, you know, of course, I was worried about Marilyn. Would she be all right? Um, so I, was, I, I really got um, <clears throat> angry by what had happened. Um, I learned afterwards that, that uh, hails of bullets had gone through the windows at the motel and uh, customers had to cringe on the floor while all these bullets came flying through into the motel. <clears throat> Fortunately, there were there were some um, uh, hunters uh, there that evening having a few drinks, and uh, they returned fire with their rifles, which is probably the only thing that, that stopped those terrorists going into the bar area and killing everybody. Um, <clears throat> so I was a bit annoyed by this. Um, I went out one evening at Jambezi to to see if we could to get rid of some of the grass that was overhanging the roads and were leading to really treacherous um, ambush points. And um, I was going to drop some guys off to, to sneak into uh, uh, villages, little huts around the area, some of them could speak the local language to see if we could pick up any intelligence. And then on the way back, I, I intended to set fire to some of these uh, really thick outgrowths where um, the gooks could hide to ambush us on our way in and out. Well, it, there'd been a light drizzle, and um, we went out in the vehicles, and I was in the lead vehicle, 
and um, it's uh, it's not uh, correct for anybody to sit on the, the front seat of a truck because you know if you if you hit a mine and so on you shouldn't be in the front seat um, but I felt that night that I wanted to drive I actually wanted to see the areas in front of me that I wanted to burn and so I, I had a license that I got when I joined the army um, I put the driver on the back and I drove in the, the front of this um, uh, four five uh, four and a half tonner with about eight or ten guys on the back and um, as we were going along you know the the droplets from the drizzle had sort of softened the surface of this dirt road it was now dark um, as we were going out and I noticed these uh, bare footprints going along um, and I thought that's unusual somebody is out after the rain had started which was only just a short while ago which means somebody is out after curfew time and that thought had barely crossed my mind when there was this massive orange flash off to my left um, and in that split second the windscreen of the truck just wobbled in and out and um, uh, there, there was instant silence after that and the smell of dust and burnt oil and burnt rubber and then out of, out of my uh, periphery vision to the right I could just see Tracer going all over the place so I thought oh well I'm, I'm either dead or this is an ambush or what the hell is going on um, I turned around to get my rifle out of its rack which was behind the on the right hand side of the driver's right shoulder and and that had been wedged in really badly um, so anyway uh, things calmed down I climbed up through the the cupola or cupola whatever you want to call it in the roof of the truck and shouted to the guys to stop I quickly determined we hadn't been ambushed there was no tracer coming towards us um, there was only red tracer going out no green or white tracer coming in told the guys to stop and then <clears throat> climbed up out through the roof onto the back and part of our training was that if you if you ever hit a mine uh, or anything like that that you would walk back uh, along your tire tracks and uh, go into all-round defense uh, the reason you do that is if you jump off the side they often sprinkled anti-personnel mines um, in the soil on the side of the road so that you've hit your mind, you jump off and bang, you lose a leg. So we got off uh, the back of the vehicle in the tracks and walked back about 60 or 70 meters. Uh, got into all-round defense and um, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, there was only one vehicle that night, which was really irresponsible of me. Um, and I quickly radioed the, the base camp for an uplift. We weren't that far, probably two kilometers from the base camp when we hit this mine. So then when I got back to the camp after we'd been uplifted, I, I went into the the ablution block where there was a, a mirror there and my hair was all stuck upright because of this oil and dust that had come out of the um, the engine block and the tires and settled all over us. And I looked like one of these wandering minstrels with the big white eyes and black skin and white light, white lips. And I had this figure staring back at me, and <laughs> I just started to laugh, mainly more from nerves than anything. The next day, we went back and did a very careful prod around to make sure there were no anti-personnel mines. And um, I had a photograph taken of me uh, leaning up against the damaged vehicle, um, which I still got somewhere. But uh, that that was my first mine, and. Um, it was just one of many that went off in the area. I think shortly after that, it was either a, um, a, a police support unit vehicle or an RAR vehicle hit a mine when the men were going back on RAR, on R&R, &R, rest and recuperation. And uh, quite a number of them were badly injured, even though they were strapped in. Um, I also discovered on my own truck that some of the armor plating had come up from the floor and had pegged in the back of the cab at roughly neck level so if anybody had sat there uh, any commander or whatever he would have had his head taken off um, 
But you know, the vehicles were fantastic. Um, I don't know whose idea it was, but um, uh, the tyres were filled with water, which acted as an incredible shock absorber to any explosion. Then there was either conveyor belting, very thick conveyor belting over the wheel arch, and then some armour plating. Um, on the back there would be uh, uh, conveyor belting, very thick stuff, um, sort of three quarters of an inch thick, um, and then sandbags, and then the seats would be put on that with seat belts and the men facing outwards. Um, and for the standard uh, Russian TMH-46 landmine, that was more than adequate to uh, get away from being killed from that. But if they boosted them, that was a problem. And we did have one guy, I think his name was Smith or Smythe, he hit a boosted mine, and he ended up flying quite high up into the air. It was his last patrol, and he landed with a thud and ten broken bones. But if we hit standard mines, uh, we could survive them. And... Um, they were pretty robust vehicles, and the ever-efficient army would come along and pick them up within a couple of days, take them back to Salisbury, and they would have them repaired in next to no time. Um, after that <coughs> experience at um, the keep and being blown up, I was uh, transferred back to, to Vic Falls. I obviously recovered from my tick bite fever, so... I had a bit of R&R &R for a couple of days and then um, was spending an enjoyable time with my girlfriend um, and was back in camp for a day <clears throat> when all hell seemed to break loose. Um, <clears throat> a very top <clears throat> terrorist by the name of Albert Ngobi had escaped from the police camp, uh, Victoria Falls police camp. Now this is a, a mean guy, he was the one who had fired at um, uh, Peter's Motel and killed that uh, salesman at the counter. Um, I think he'd also been responsible for raids on, was it the Cannings Farm or somebody like that. He he was a nasty guy. And anyway, he'd been caught in a bear hall in Bulawayo. Um, we'd often done follow-ups on, on him. He had big feet, big footprint. And um, he'd been caught uh, mouthing off in a bear hall in Bulawayo and had been caught and now he had been brought back to Vic Falls, and I actually met him at the place where um, he was showing us how he had attacked Peters. And he was a tall man, I would say six foot six, had big bushy hair, uh, quite a gangly sort of frame. But um, his eyes were what they would describe in the novels as sort of yellow. Uh, instead of having whites of the eyes, they were yellow, probably from some type of fever that he had had. And he was an evil-looking bastard. In fact, uh, when he stared at me, I was the first to look away. But um, So I'd met this guy, and now he'd gone to temporary holding cells in Big Falls, and uh, he escaped. And I say that in inverted commas, because... To this day, I don't know how he escaped the jail from Vic Falls. It, it was pretty, pretty uh, solid, uh, solid walls, solid bars. Um, I think somebody let him out. It's possible that he had been turned. He was one of our guys. I don't know. But anyway, he escaped. And at seven in the morning, uh, we started a follow-up operation to uh, uh, following his tracks, which we were quite successful at. He had these big feet, this massive stride between each steps, and we headed off west. Um, our entire troop level at that point in time, I think, was probably one or two platoons, and we were, uh, my guys, uh, we I spread my guys out um, every 200 meters on the Kazangula Road, because the Kazangula Road goes from Victoria Falls west to Botswana, and it creates a strip of land between the river and the road. Now, if we kept him north of the road, then we could catch him because it's a national park. But if he managed to turn south and then southeast back into the tribal trust lands, which was hugely populated, he would have mingled with them and disappeared. Um, anyway, so... 
we guessed how far ahead he was. Uh, we estimated how far he could have run in the hour that it took us to respond. And so at that point, uh, I put down two men every 100 or 200 uh, yards or meters. Uh, every second bunch of guys had a radio, and we just put them along there. And then we had a vehicle drive up and down very slowly with uh, guys that were good at tracking, and they were looking for the, the footprints on, on the southern side of the road. And then as time lapsed, I would pick up the guy at the back and ferry, him, ferry them to the front, the two guys. And so we were leapfrogging some type of blocking force on the Kazangula Road. In the meantime, other guys were uh, hot on his tail in the bush. And we kept going west and kept going west until eventually we were miles and miles down the road. Um, and his uh, spore had got lost. And so by that time we had reached a, a very distinctive bend in the tar road that then sort of turned north and into a, a very good dirt road that then bent left or west up to Kazangula, which is the border uh, base between um, uh, Rhodesia and Botswana and just over the, the back of that was the Caprivi Strip and uh, over the river was Zambia. So we got to that uh, bend in the road and uh, all of the guys had been picked up and we went through to the police station at Kazangula which was about I, don't know, I suppose 10 k's east of the border coast or post or five or six between five and ten k's east of the border post and um, we were told to stay there that night uh, which was fantastic because uh, we were sopping wet we were foot sore by the time we got there we were cold we didn't really leave with more than a day's rations on us and anyway uh, i was very blessed to be given my own private quarters and um, uh, got into had a beautiful hot shower got into the bed of the police camp after a few jugs in the pub, um, which was a fantastic atmosphere there, and um, uh, went to bed, was woken up at 6 o'clock in the morning with a lovely cup of coffee and a guy all dressed in whites, so rank does have its privileges. And um, when I got on the, the radio, I was uh, told to wait there until a couple of armoured cars arrived and um, um, a, a two-inch mortar with about 30 rounds of ammo. And they were going to change uh, my task from looking for Albert to actually flying the flag along the Botswana border. So if you look at a the map, there's Kazangula in the northwest, and our task was to drive um, south southeast along the road between uh, Rhodesia and Botswana and just basically show the flag which I thought would be a nice little outing although by that stage I'd hit the line and I thought well dirt roads and mines don't go well together anyway we were at the at the police camp and slowly but surely this Eland armored car and the second world war type uh, ferret scout car came along and I thought to myself, well, this is not exactly the 4th um, Cavalry Regiment of the American Army or something. But anyway, we'd been given a, an Eland, which had a very good 90mm um, main weapon on it. Um, in fact, when you think that the Tiger tanks in the Second World War only had 88mm guns, this, this little noddy car had a 90 mil and the rounds were tall enough to come up to beyond your belly button. So they were, it was a mean, a mean gun on that little knotty car, but it was very thinly armoured. The ferret car had a, a browning mounted up uh, up on top where the driver was, uh, in, the, in the sort of uh, top turret that swung left and right. And they met us, and I was given the, the mortar tube, a uh, two-inch mortar tube, with, like I say, a box full of about... Uh, 30 or 40 rounds uh, in it and I thought while we were there we would go around the back of the customs post and just uh, mosey on over to the the actual border itself and there was a there were two bunkers right where Rhodesia and uh, Botswana joined there was a fence 
uh, in the launch pad for the ferry from Botswana over to Zambia. And there were two bunkers there. One had been built, I think, by the South Africans. It was a big bunker, but it, it was full of um, hornets. And so um, I thought, I'm not going to go in there. And I went down to the one that was right on the river, um, just literally yards from the Botswana fence, maybe 50 meters away. And anyway, parked the, the eland behind the bunker and the, the ferry went under a tree over to the right. And uh, I debussed with my guys. By that time, um, I only had about 10 men with me. Others had gone back to, to do uh, other things, uh, other commitments that the major had given them to do. And so um, I, I went into the bunker and uh, had a look at the, the other guys on the other side, the Zambians. <clears throat> uh, they were about uh, 300 yards away, 400 meters at the most, uh, about 350. And uh, we could clearly see them. They climbed up onto the roof of their bunker and they started swearing at us and telling us that we were little white children and that Ian Smith was a uh, bleep, 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 bleep. And I thought, you can't swear it uh, our smithy like that. So I stood up on the roof of my bunker with a few other guys, and we, we started a very um, nice little dialogue with the Zambians. And all the, all the time I was getting really wound up. I was getting pissed off. I've always been shot at, blown at, blown up and everything, and not having a chance to do anything about it. Um, near the bunker was um, like a... a a small observation tower, I don't even know what it was, maybe a radio tower, but I decided to climb up it to get a more elevated view of what was on the other side. And my, uh, myself and a guy called Gormor, we climbed up there and uh, had my binos and I could see on the other side uh, were probably a, a dozen or so army vehicles parked under a tree. And then in the foreground, right on the riverbank, was a fairly substantial bunker. I could see at least eight people uh, looking at me through the, the slit, a couple more on the roof with their helmets on, and they were getting all belligerent. And um, to the right of that, or east, there was obviously a machine gun pit. And so I made a note of all of this and climbed down the, the, uh, the ladder. And when I got to the bottom, um, I... I I did something very stupid, I must admit, and I'm sure any professional soldier listening to this will think I'm a bit of a wanker, but I, I was just kind of angry at that time as a young guy, uh, and I was um, starting to get very bitter towards these characters. So um, there was a mortar pit just to the right of the bunker facing the river, and there was an, a pole, um, about an eight-foot pole lying around on the side there, and I got the guys to pick it up and put it into the, the little mortar pit. And and I could see the Zambians, the, the others were all putting their helmets on now. And guys were looking at us through binos. And um, then I got a round out of the eland. And uh, like I said, it was a big round. And uh, our guys sort of looked as if they were getting ready for action. And I pretended to lift up this round to the end of the stove pipe. And um, obviously, it was just a pipe, and that was just a round from the armored car. It couldn't have been fired. But um, the next thing was all hell let loose, and they opened up on us like you can't believe. And so we all rushed into the bunker. I told the guys to set their sights to to 350 or 400 and to commence firing main target the bunker and and so it turned into a very pleasant exchange um, in pauses in, in when there was pause in the firing I could hear the rounds hitting the corrugated uh, uh, wrought iron work on the outside of the bunker within which there was a concrete wall uh, I guess they'd used the corrugated iron for shuttering but I could hear the rounds going clunk, 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 and tush, past us. Um, it's not like in the movies, you don't actually hear bang, you hear twick, twick, and the thump in the background. So anyway, we put a lot of fire into the bunker, 
into what I assumed to be a, a machine gun nest east of that. But then it started to get really hairy because um, uh, the the ferret was allowed to open fire, but not the the main gun on the armored car. We had to get permission from Wanky for that. Anyway, there was a massive explosion above the um, the ferret, and half of this tree came tumbling down on it. And the commander only just got inside the car before this thing came crashing down. And then he reversed into another position and and got back into the action. And then RPG-7s and mortars were landing all around us. It was really quite hairy. Uh, and the ferret, uh, I'll never forget the guy, a blonde guy with a big hook nose. He just let rip with long rips into that bunk on the other side. Um, and then I thought, well, I'm... I'm going to have a go at them as well because we had the mortar tube. Um, and at this point, it started to get really hairy, hairy because even further east, about 400 meters further east, which was down river, um, this big gun opened up on us. It must have been a 12.7 because it had um, a white tracer, which normally only came from a bigger gun. And we could hear it <coughs> really nasty with this, these streaks of white light everywhere and the ferret guy said if that hits me i'm going to be turned into swiss swiss cheese so he reversed out the gate and that was the last you saw of him and i don't blame him it was the appropriate thing to do the eland on the other hand was behind the bunker so this fire couldn't reach it but he would have been in the same predicament if he had decided to stick his nose around and have another go at the enemy on the other side um, all the while, my guys were firing away and recharging their magazines, and I had to go to a few. One soldier poked his nose around the customs post on the other side, and I had to go at him, and he seemed to disappear very quickly. Um, I'm pretty sure I hit him, actually. Um, and then uh, I thought, well, we've got this multitude. I've got to suppress the fire coming from the other side. I'd seen where all the positions were. And so myself and Abbott, the guy who'd refused to open the gate uh, that time at Jambizi Key, him and another guy, we, we jumped into this uh, into the mortar pit and we set up the two-incher and I started uh, dropping rounds onto the other side. I tried to to uh, get it as near, get the, the, the shells as near as possible to the bunker wouldn't have done the bunker any damage, of course, but, you know, enough to make them jittery and nervous or keep their heads down. Um, the first couple of rounds landed short in the river, but then I added a charge, extra charge, and by the fourth round I was zeroed in and dropping these shells all over the place and into the, the machine gun pit. And then I swung it east, uh, and I could actually see a bit of smoke drifting up from where this 12.7 was firing at us. And um, I put it about 12 rounds into that area, a couple landing short until I'd zeroed in, and that put paid to that. Um, one of the rounds must have hit some dry grass, and before I knew it, the entire uh, front facing us was on fire with a very strong wind blowing to the, the left or west, and it was now getting dark. Uh, about two hours before darkness, and the, the flames were really quite obvious being reflected on the river. But just prior to this, the the eland, you know, we we had to be, uh, we had to suppress the fire. So we, the the commander inside the eland, had um, radioed the jock back in Wanky, and we were given permission to open fire with it. So we had suppressed the 12.7 by that point. And so the eland uh, crept round the bunker. Um, its uh, its muzzle was level with our ears. So I said to the guys, "Just block your ears. He's going to fire." Um, the first round went off, and uh, there was like a plug that scooted across the water. I don't know what that was, but he was a little bit high, and there was a big crack on the other side. Must have landed pretty close to the vehicle park behind the bunker, actually. 
and then he adjusted his sights and he just put round after round into the bunker um, heat rounds which was very satisfying to watch it's got a lovely primary crack and uh, tertiary thump that weapon and then I told him to go right to where the machine gun nest was uh, that I could see between uh, the bunker and the customs post and he put a couple of rounds in there um, at that point a little red car had come down to the water to wait for the ferry from Botswana and a little red car and out of it jumped two white civilians and they looked absolutely horrified as I looked at them through the binoculars and they ran into the Zambian customs post or behind it for protection and um, anyway um, we the armored car continued firing and put a couple of rounds into the base of that tree to make sure the 12.7 didn't get back into action and um, uh, by that stage it, it was getting quite dark and I told the guys to stop firing and uh, the whole opposing bank was awash with flames because the, the grass was quite long at that point and there was just a crackle of the flames and the smell of cordite and you know our hearts were thumping away and and uh, we were slapping each other's shoulders in hindsight it was a stupid irresponsible thing to do i could have got guys killed but you know i'm wearing my heart on my sleeve here i was a young glute 20 years of age and um i didn't like them calling Smithy a dog or whatever whatever they said. So when it was fully dark, I told the guys to walk out the, the back of the enclosure. It was uh, We were enclosed by some three-strand wire fence and a gate. I told them to walk back uh, two or three hundred meters and wait for me. We got all the kit back on the truck and then I said to the driver, I'll drive it out because the, as soon as the headlights, well I didn't use headlights, but if any sign of that vehicle was seen from the other side, us, us moving out of there, it would have been a target for anything they still had left to throw at us. And so I got some empty ammunition boxes and I, they fitted these ammunition packets that came out of the ammo box. And they were a perfect fit over the rear, rear tail lights of the truck. And I put them on there and started the vehicle up and there was just enough moonlight and starlight and flames from the other side for me to drive out of there um, and go back the 200 yards uh, meters and and meet my guys and so we were in a real jovial mood by the time we got back to the, the police camp uh, bears were on the cops and we had a party going there and then at about 10 o'clock that night there were massive explosions coming from the west and the the commander of the police camp, the police, to whatever you call him, inspector, a nice guy, I forget his name now, he patted me on the shoulder and said, come with me. And we ran out the back and there was uh, quite a, a large uh, communications tower at the camp, a very nice one, red and white painted rungs and steel going all the way up. And we climbed up to a platform that must have been about, I don't know, 60, 70 feet up. And I could still see the flames to the west, and um, there were some really loud bangs, loud thuds. Who knows what happened there um, after we left? Um, but it, um, it reminded me of a general in the Second World War who got so wise to when Russian attacks were going to come in that he he pulled his men out before they commenced, and then he slaughtered them east of Berlin. I forget the name of that, but it was a mini Berlin withdrawal <laughs> to get to the police camp and um, anyway that's uh, where we went and we had drinks and celebrated and then the police guy said um, I think his name was Kemp he said I've got a boat down on the river and he said just along the way here is the Zambian army officers quarters and they've got big plate glass windows that face the river where they sit and have sundowners so he said, let's go and shoot the hell out of the windows. So um, being the young, irresponsible guy I was, we went down there with a, a couple of MHGs and, and rifles and
got in the boat and we sped off upstream to the west. It was such a beautiful, the water was so tranquil that the reflection of the stars on the water made it look like we were floating in space. It was quite a weird feeling. Anyway, we zigzagged between all these uh, uh, bushes and the grass uh, in the river, all these uh, reeds, should I say, and, and slowed down as we approached the army quarters, uh, the Zambian army officers' quarters, it was, I believe, and uh, uh, Kemp put the boat in gear or in neutral and just giving us enough speed to, to become stationary and we put the, the belts of ammo into the MOGs and we emptied about 200 rounds into their camp and then um, into their windows, the glass windows and it was very satisfying to hear it all come collapsing down and then we went back to the um, the police camp and we were removed the next day, I uh, had to go back to give the Major a briefing on what had happened. Um, I thought I was going to get into trouble, and I probably should have got into trouble. Now, the, the the downside of what I did that day is that they made the Zambians very angry, and they retaliated uh, several months later, and I believe the SAS had to go over there and put landmines down, and a Zambian army commander was killed when he went through the area on a mine, and artillery was taken up there, I, I believe 105s that we had at the time, as well as 24-pounders, it turned into quite a punch-up, and, um, uh, and then there was even another one with uh, uh, Don Price, there was a major punch-up uh, with Don up at that area, and um, that lasted 30 odd hours. By that time I'd left the uh, the army when that happened uh, for Indep and I was a croupier at Victoria Falls with my girlfriend and I could hear all the thuds and bangs 70 kilometers away in Vic Falls from that night uh, Sunday afternoon in, right until Monday I think um, that Don had this uh, big touch up with the Zambians. Um, but yeah, and hopefully in one of his talks in Fighting Men in Rhodesia, he will actually relate that episode. Um, and I encourage you to go across to Fighting Men in Rhodesia and listen to the stories on there. So I'm going to end this now, uh, my third edition. Um, not long after this event, um, I was transferred to one independent company, which was Don Price's company. Uh, I hadn't been uh, on any leave at uh, that point in time, so when I got up to Don, I was only with him night, possibly two nights, and he said to me, your luck's in, you're going on R&R &R for 10 days or a week or whatever I had, and I was so chuffed, and because uh, he was based up at Bingo, I think, and um, so anyway, I hopped on an aeroplane and flew back to Vic Falls to be with my girlfriend. And that's where I'm going to end this episode because what happened when I got back to Big Falls uh, was something I'll never forget and I'll be sharing that in part four. So thanks for staying tuned and um, have a look at um, Fighting Men Rhodesia on YouTube. I think there are about 17 or 18 episodes at this point in time and there's also five Romeo Romeo, very good anecdotes. Uh, and other other sites on there talking about what Rhodesian soldiers got up to. Okay, thanks for listening, and um, I look forward to chatting to you again in the near future. Bye.